Working Cows Podcast, Episode 160. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Hi everybody, this is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows Podcast here with another episode for you guys, and this will be the first episode recorded entirely on uh, new equipment that I received from a generous listener through my Amazon wish list, so thank you very much, I uh, really appreciate that, it's taken some of the, the work out of the front end, and, and I realize a little delayed here, but uh, fall work is, is in full swing, and so I've uh, been busy with uh, helping neighbors get calves shipped and worked and different things like that. So appreciate your patience, but uh, really looking forward to today's episode, talking to Steve Campbell, had the opportunity to uh, tour some land uh, and and more more appropriately look at some cow herds, uh, uh, specifically Bart Carmichael's cows at Wedge Tent Angus Ranch, and they're doing some good things there, selecting cattle that are adapted to the environment and uh, fitting fitting the environment that they're in. really appreciate that opportunity that uh, was given by Bart Carmichael. And if you're looking for a bull, if you're in the market, I think Bart's a great place to start uh, looking as far as a cow or a bull that's fitted to uh, the environment and able to, to do it on grass. And they're, they're making their cows work for them so that they will go to work for you as well. So uh, look them up, Wedge 10 Angus Ranch uh, near Faith, South Dakota. And uh, really excited to talk to Steve today about what makes a good cow and how we find cows that uh, will work in our environment. So Steve, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I was pleased to have the opportunity to spend a couple of days with you at Bart Carmichael's here, uh, just north of Faith, South Dakota. Uh, he's become a, a good friend, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come out and walk through uh, some of his cattle and to, and to hear some of your perspectives on those things. And I, I do want to say to you on the front end that um, I've been around cows my whole life, and I feel like in those two days, <laughs> I learned more about what to look for in in cattle than I have in the rest of my life combined before that. And uh, I, I was, I told you, uh, I told you that, and I also told you that you've ruined me. I, I find myself driving around looking at all these uh, cattle along the road and having more things to look at. So there's even more reason to drive onto the rumble strips if I'm not, not paying attention. But uh, I, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to spend some time looking at cattle with you and having you point out things uh, that are that are more and less desirable and uh, really think um, I was impressed by some of what I saw uh, having spent some time with you on what Bart's doing there with his herd at Wedge Tent Angus Ranch. Well, thank you for those kind words, but this is not things that I figured out on my own. I had a pretty good mentor in Gerald Fry and a number of others, but most of the things that we talk about uh, are things that our grandfathers and great grandfathers knew by just living with the animals. And uh, those things have not been taught in recent history. And it's for a lot of people a breath of fresh air to find out that. They themselves, without technology, can go out and determine fairly accurately animals that will perform in an all-grass situation. Um, Any one cow can make a liar out of you. The, the calf is kind of your trump card. But there are things to look for, and we a lot of times find ourselves in a situation where our, our cattle aren't providing us an income anymore, and how do we jump back into the middle of a animal herd that that will or a cow herd i should say yeah and that's kind of the the bottom line uh literally is is that profit uh kind of motivator and we're wanting to find those cows that can do more with less inputs is that does that kind of go along with how you think about it 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, a little later here, as we get to talking, uh, we'll explain some of them, but 40% of your profit is a cow that'll have a calf every year. And 30% is uh, what does it cost to run that cow? And there's a lot of things we can look at on the outside of the cow that'll tell us about whether they'll achieve those two goals. So what are some of the, what are some, could you just run through a list of some of the things that do lead to that cow that's going to be able to uh, get by on less inputs or, or produce, you know, she's 30% of it is what does it cost her to raise that calf? Uh, So can you talk about some of the, some of the characteristics from a, from a phenotype perspective, when we're looking at that cow, what are we going to be seeing as we look at her profile, as we look at her cross section, what are we going to be seeing uh, when we look at that cow? And then we'll kind of dive into how do we, how do we make improvements and how do we uh, change some of those things in our own herd? Well, I want to step back one thing first, the, the early shedding cows, regardless of their phenotype, early shedding cows, a better glandular system, a better hormonal system. And you can't find that. You don't find that very often in most herds. So that is, for me, the first most sought after attribute in a cow. It's probably the one that takes the longest to change. Um, Number two, either butterfat or phenotype. However, in most herds, a phenotype is what I'm looking for. And and a cow, everything as you go back should get bigger. In a bull, everything as you go forward should get bigger. So talking about this wedge on the cow, everything getting bigger as you go back first and foremost, uh, back to that hormonal function. Sex hormones shut off long bone growth. So the taller a cow is in any breed, the fewer sex hormones she's producing. The cows or females that are producing the most sex hormones are going to shut off long bone growth in the front end first. So the fertile females, the most fertile females, should look like they're walking downhill on level ground on the top side. Their shoulders should be shorter than the hips. Then uh, Ken Redman from Sydney, Montana, he wrote his uh, doctoral thesis or master's thesis on uh, linear measurement and found three commonalities with uh, old cows, uh, anywhere from Mexico clear up to uh, Canada. He used 9,500 head to come up with his number three commonalities with old cows cows that had had 10 or 11 calves in a row they had a bigger belly than the herd average i I interject they could eat enough for three herself her calf the one in utero they could eat enough for three in a dry year the next commonality was a, a wider butt than the herd average which That's two things, Uh, a wider pelvis, it's easier to get the calf out, and then a wider butt, the uh, easier fleshing. Michael McDonald, who was, God rest his soul, a a linear measuring fellow also, said the two best numbers to compare for fertility in the cow is how much wider her butt was than its length. The length is measured from the hook bones, the front of the hook bones to the back of the pin bones. The width is typically the stifle muscle down on the side. Um, We want to be two and a half inches or wider. Uh, My better cows have all been in the at least three to four inches wider than they were long. And then the third one, he used uh, thorough, but I just describe it as slope from hooks to pins. The more slope there is from hooks to pins, the easier it is to get that great big calf out when we use the wrong bull. So old cows had three commonalities linear measurement wise, a big belly, a wide butt, slope from hooks to pins. You're uh, far more widely traveled than I am, and I, uh, I'm i okay, I'm totally comfortable with confessing my own in- ignorance. So I've, I had heard... Uh, 
the terms hooks and pins uh, through FFA judging, uh, but didn't stick with FFA judging to learn what that was. And so is that, uh, are those widely understood stood terms? I came to understand them after spending two days with you or about actually about an hour with you. <laughs> but uh, are those widely understood terms or do you think we need to define those for, for some listeners? Well, we can define those. You think about a dairy cow and uh, it, just on the front, front side of her back legs up on her back she's got these two big bones that stick out there because she doesn't have much fat those are the hook bones and you're measuring from the front side of those the pin bones are on either side of the tail and if you felt them it would be the part of that whole pelvic structure that stuck back the most on a, a dairy cow again you it's very easy to see, but if you've got a beef cow and a body condition score six, you're going to have a little harder time seeing where they actually are. If she was in a four and a half frames, or excuse me, a body condition score, you would be able to see the back edge of those pin bones. Yep. And I thought that was, that was helpful. Uh, so Kind of going back to where you started there, uh, you talked about the early shedding animal, and I noticed on one of the slides um, that you you had written there when you talked about early shedding, Bonsma's one thing, and that's referring to Jan Bonsma, the S- South African, uh, I, I don't know if he was an academic and a rancher, but I know that he did do some work in academia, uh, and, and that's, that's accurate, right? Bonsma's one thing was early shedding. That's the first thing we look for. Yes. And, and when I say one thing, I don't mean that was the only thing he looked at. He looked at a lot of things, but early shedding appeared to be the most important thing that I read out of his works at which man must measure. If you could find that book anymore, it probably cost you upwards of $500, and then the Bonsma Lectures, which I actually think is the layperson's uh, easier to read, more applicable version of Bonsma, and it's when he was here in the States back in the uh, 60s and early 70s. And then we move on to butterfat and or phenotype, and I I don't think we have time necessarily today to go into the whirls, swirls, and quirls curls discussion for for looking at butterfat uh that's a that is a fascinating discussion as well and and uh, again (laughs) trailing trailing cattle has become a lot more interesting to me because i can look at uh the escutcheons and and the (laughs) the 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 way that the the hair lies on the back legs to determine uh you know butterfat and and how fast and how long she's going to stay at peak milk production so uh, it's a, that's a worthwhile discussion, but I, I don't know that we have time to to go there today. But if there's anything you want to say on a on a cursory level, uh, I'd give you that opportunity. Well, Clay, it is one of a number of things that you can use to determine uh, butterfat in the cow. This uh, Francois Guinon, a Frenchman, it took him about thirty years to figure this out in dairy cows in France. In uh, the early 1800s and the French government after running a hundred head by him said, uh, I'm going to paraphrase here. If a person were to follow the treaties as laid down by Francois Guinon, there need be no doubt as to whether a heifer born on your farm would be a good milker or not. Or if you were going to go to someone's farm to purchase a heifer, you could tell with certainty whether you were going to get taken in the the transaction or not. And he was the first person in the history of France, uh, I later found, who got a pension. It's like, we will just pay you to go around and uh, and teach this for the rest of your life to as many people as, as you can find. We feel this is so valuable to agriculture in France in 1848. And I thought about that when you were when you were sharing that with us and I I wondered about what percentage of the French population in those days had a family milk cow. I would I would guess it's more than a majority. 
uh, of of people in those days had a family milk cow. There was kind of that su- subsistence level farming going on, and uh, there you know there wasn't necessarily, of, of course, refrigeration or or milk delivery wasn't wasn't widely available uh, back in those days. So you know I, I think that's a another thing. It's it's almost a survival issue of this is going to be. I'm not going to waste my money buying this cow. She's going to be a good milker. She's going to produce uh, rich quality milk for my family for, for years to come. And that's correct. And, and it wasn't infallible to someone like you and I looking at it. I kind of, sorry, uh, try to make it uh, as simple as I possibly can for uh, a beef producer. However, if you wanted to study the milch cow, by Francois Guinan, you can, they have reprints now. You can get your own copy of that and, and it's quite in depth. But rarely, he says in the book, if you find uh, that really good discussion, rarely do you find it where it is not on a really good cow. And then, so we'll move on to, to pheno, phenotype for the rest of this conversation, um, talking about the. First of all, I guess starting with the sex hormones shut off long bone growth and and they shut off long bone growth in the cows in the front end first. And so she's going to look like she's walking downhill on level ground. Uh, would you say that's the first thing you look for in a in a cow uh or w- is there is there another is there another place to start or w- what are you where where are you at on that? Um good question. And the answer is it depends. <laughs> Typically, I'm I'm looking for the animal with the most uniform hair coat, depending on time of year. And then I start looking for that wedge look. On the top, she's getting taller as she goes back. On the bottom, she's getting deeper as she goes back. And then I start looking closer after that. Another thing that helped was uh, I've been a member of Johann Zietzman's text, texting group for a couple of years now, I think. And uh, I've always felt like I'm maybe just barely keeping my nose above water in that group, just reading through what they're talking about. And uh, I think what you what you did for me is put a lot of a lot of mortar in the cracks <laughs> of what what I've seen in that group. And uh, the way Johan talks about it is inherent body condition score, um, you know, the ability to to stay fat on on fewer inputs. And and he talks about the early maturing animal that sex hormones shut off long bone growth, uh, kind of all, all of those things, uh, coming together. Uh, and that's part of what, what you're talking about. Clay it is. And if your readers don't know, Johan wrote a book here. I don't know how many years ago called man cattle and V E L D you pronounce the V as an F and that, that word means grass. That is an excellent book. Yep, and it, it's been linked at the resources page since I think day one of the Working Cows podcast. Uh, it was on the back table at the High Plains Ranch Practicum, and so it will be linked in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 160 is the show notes page for today. People can go there and, and find links. We'll have links, if I can find them, to the Milch Cow and, and the Bonsma lectures and and all those things. It'll, it'll be a growing list as the episode goes on, uh, but... Yeah, so those are those are just kind of the, some of the things we were talking about. Um, walking downhill on level ground, getting deeper on the bottom as she goes back. Uh, some of the things that I've noticed since sitting in with you and looking at it is uh, that I, I I have a lot of cows that have a a really large gut, um, and it but it kind of rounds off. Uh, it isn't it isn't a straight line uh, on the on the bottom side going from front to back it kind of goes up before it gets to the gets into the hips or uh you know what you would what you would talk about as the flank on a on a horse i guess is that is that a part of it or or do you want that to be kind of a straight line from front to back on the bottom no you well the box car cow people that really know what they're doing can make those work the uh the more acres it takes for a uh, a cow to to make a living, you know, 200 acres, the more you can use that deeper front-ended cow. Uh, But typically we are not looking for uh, a flat bottom on a cow 
to have one that's more productive. If I might go into a little bit finer detail here, on the front end of the cow, we want the toes pointing straight forward. That means that she's wide enough in the front end to support the weight that's above her. We, we want, while we're on the front end, we want her backbone level with her shoulder blades when she's just standing there. Similarly, on the back, we want the back toes pointing straight forward. We don't want a quote unquote cow hawked cow. That means she's not wide enough in the back. And we don't want that grow bone right behind the hooks jumping up and and going back uh, because we've got a, a pelvis that's setting in there too flat. We we want that backbone straight or maybe slightly rounded um, from the hook bones back to the tail. One thing, and people will take this too far, we have the pendulum has swung too far. A little bit of raised tail process gives you a growthier calf. Well, 20% of our profit comes from growth and 10% from carcass characteristics. That is what you hear industry talking about all the time because that puts money in their pocket, but not the rancher's pocket. Yeah, that, and that, that was another, another one of those things. Uh, so would you say uh, cows with a, a raised tail process are going to throw calves that should be slotted for the terminal side of your operation? Uh, like, don't keep replacement females out of that out of that cow. Uh, how do you? How would you think about some of those things? In general, that's accurate. But however, <laughs> as you heard me say a lot of times, it depends. What is your starting point? How good is the bull that you're working with? If if pulling numbers out of the air, if you scored all your cows and let's just say they were a two, and you went and you found a bull that was a three, the first cross is going to be a two and a half. We got, we moved a little bit in the right direction, but if you could go and find a bull that was a four, now we've moved to a three with the offspring. And then in the next cross, we're at a three and a half. Uh Oh, I just talked about breeding daddy back to daughter that probably people are going to turn the radio off at this point, but a lot of places would be well served to do that however it depends has to be said pretty loudly <laughs> yeah yeah so i've 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 heard this said and you can you can tell me if i'm wrong when it works it's uh line breeding when it doesn't it's inbreeding perfect exactly <laughs> so that, <clears throat> i don't know was that your article in the stockman grass farmer i didn't even look but i know that was a that was a line in the stockman grass farmer at one time <laughs> but, uh, uh, um actually i i th- I think Alan Williams said it the most recently. Okay. At, I've heard it a number of times before. Um, I wrote an article here a few years ago. I guess it was just two called Bellies, Barebacks, Bald Udders, Wide Butts. And it was uh, the way I had summarized a talk that I had given over in Australia to a group of people. Uh, the Bald Udder signifying probably the most accurately of anything you could do for butterfat would be a bald udder. However, a bald udder at the Mexican border of the U S is going to have less hair on it than a bald udder in Bismarck, North Dakota. I think we've kind of covered a few of these things, uh, looking at the cow from the side. Uh, are there any indications that we can get looking at the cow from the front about what kind of a critter she is? Excellent question. Um, the width of the muzzle uh, kind of tells you two things. One, how big of a bite she can take. But two, and maybe more importantly, the width of the muzzle is approximately equal to the width of the pin bones. The pelvic opening is approximately 80 to 85% as wide as the pin bones. So if you've got a heifer calf, a yearling heifer, a cow with a very narrow muzzle, we're going to be pulling more calves out of that one, everything else being equal, than uh, one that uh, the muzzle is wide. Now, we could have a typically a cow with a very narrow muzzle, but the slope from hooks to pins was tremendous. And we can get the calf out. And we can have a wide-muzzled cow 
who's flat from hooks to pins and we're pulling a calf. But everything else being equal, you have 100 cows with wide muzzles, you're going to pull fewer calves than 100 cows with narrow muzzles. And and again, I think a lot of what we're doing here today is is talking about things that people do need to to see uh, to uh, to wrap their minds around a little bit. I think you're doing a great job of painting painting some pictures, uh, but I would encourage people to to try to track down Steve at some point and and sit in on 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 a, some of his lectures because they were very helpful to me. Uh, so I think that's good. Did we did we miss anything as far as the profile of the cow when you're looking at her from the side? Is there anything else that you would like to say about about a cow when you're looking at her from the side? Things to look for. Well, back to that front on deal. Her her face should be about an inch longer than it is wide at the eyeballs, and the the most cows have too big ears. They need to be a little smaller and a little more pointed. Uh, that would be butterfat. That would be tender meat from the side or from the front. We don't need a bone, a big bone on our animals, finer boned animals down to a point, but I haven't found that point yet <laughs> are going to be more butter fat, more tender meat. If you're direct marketing, you want fine bones. Uh, there was a book written in uh, 1868 by a veterinarian named Hewitt, and he talked about a pointed pole. Well, uh, if you pictured uh, cutting a golf ball in half and setting it on top of the pole of a cow, that's about as small as I've seen, and the meat is incredible. On a bull, if you cut a tennis ball in half and set it on top of the pole, that's about as small as I've seen. Another indicator for tender meat, butter fat, uh, probably fewer flies would be associated. Uh, vertical folds in the hide from the neck clear back to the back of the, the ribs. Rarely do you find it that far back to the back of the ribs. That is a very loose hide. It would be more butter fat in the daughters of that bull. It would be more butter fat for the offspring of that cow. Uh, looking at her from the back, uh, a broom-tailed cow, a very small in diameter handle or tailbone, and a big switch on the end, more fertile, more butter fat, mm. and oddly enough, easier calving usually. So I, I, like I said, a, a lot of times, like I say a lot of times, I'm not trying to exhaust the topic. I'm trying to pique people's interest so they they go out and and track you down and sit in on a <laughs> on a on a lecture. Uh, but how do we go about choosing choosing females that get to stay? Um, you know, I mean, you said 40% is she brings in a calf. Uh, okay, so we've got 100 cows that are bringing in calves in this herd, um, and we want to start selecting for a more profitable animal. Uh, where where do we start? Um, is that and and this is for maybe the guy that's going to rip the bandaid off and say, I'm gonna I'm gonna be, I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna apply it to my herd. I'm gonna select animals uh, based on some of these criteria. Uh, first of all, you're responsible for your own decisions. I know I'm talking to, to people who understand that, but I'll, I'll say it out loud, <laughs> but how, how, where do we start as far as choosing animals that, that get to stay in the herd? Well, the calf is your trump card. Um, any one cow can make a liar out of you. He, she can check all of these boxes and have a bad calf. She can check none of these boxes and have a great calf. And, you know, there's some history and the epigenetics and and that's another story but uniform hair coat regardless of time of year uh, that catches my eye and then the big belly everybody thinks they eat more but they actually digest better so they they eat less mm. uh anibal poor domingo got his phd in the 90s at new mexico state the average beef cow in the u.s digests 55 percent of what she ingests he heard gerald fry talk uh about 2000 little maybe a little after went back dug his research out and found some cows digest 70 percent of what they eat and others only 40 so <laughs> the reverse wedge remember me talking about everything getting bigger as the cow went back well if you have a cow with the reverse wedge she's getting 
taller as she goes forward. She has very masculine characteristics. Sex hormones are not there. We, for a cow, we need estrogen. She's saying, I don't have it. And then on the bottom side, right behind the front legs, it just tapers up to the udder. She, there's, she cannot eat enough for three. Um, so I was in a herd the other day and the first deal, well, just get rid of all the reverse wedges and you'll be a lot happier. It takes two good cows to pay for every one of those. How do we start to select bulls then that can help us fix some of these issues in our herd? Well, on the bull, testosterone shuts off long bone growth in the back end first. So he should look like he's walking uphill on level ground. The, we don't want bulls with their front toes pointed out. Uh, the wider the, the front shoulders on a bull, the wider the rump on the offspring. Uh, toes pointing straight forward or a really masculine bull slightly pigeon-toed. The width across the top of the shoulder blades, we want him flat across there, but the wider he is across the top of those shoulder blades, the uh, the more masculine. The year mom and dad got married, 1950, <laughs> dad said, whatever you do when you go to Clay's place, don't ask him how many cows he's got. It's Clay how much money you got in the bank. Count his bulls, multiply times 50, you'll be real close. Anyway, the front end on the bulls puts the wide end on the back of cows for each inch at one year of age. For each inch, the shoulders are wider than the length of the rump. It's two and a half days less gestation, which is about a five pound smaller calf. So really masculine bulls are going to have a calf come out 10 or 15, two or three inches. 10 or 15 pounds smaller, and then they grow like gangbusters. Mm. Mm. A calving ease bull. More masculine. More masculine Absolutely. bulls, more calving ease. Yep. And then <clears throat> will those things kind of by default lead to cows that m more typically, you know, any cow can make a lighter out of you. It depends. Uh, notwithstanding, uh, will... Will more masculine bulls lead to more feminine females uh, from from those cows? Yes, and and I don't like using masculine and feminine because it's fairly subjective. Fertile, more hmm. fertile bulls will give you more fertile cows. Most of us need to kind of jump back into the middle of uh, a more grass efficient animal. It the size of the belly of the bull himself doesn't matter that much he just needs to come from a family of big bellied cows and if you go out and find a bull at the stars aligned and he looks like all of that you're gonna have better calves but if you can go find a bull who comes from the family and years of thoughtful breeding you're gonna have more of the cookie cutter calf crop out of the uh, bull producer that has done years of thoughtful breeding and that's the the cookie cutter calf crop is even and uh moving the herd in a positive direction is that is that what you're saying well moving the herd in a positive direction yes and and what is that positive direction females that can have a calf every year and cost you less to run than the current ones that you have in in my mind that's more profit on the ranch keeps more ranchers on the land we sequester more carbon we grow better food everybody gets healthy how about how about hormonally ba balanced animals how do we how can you look at something that's and and see its hormonal balance is there is it the the early shedding uh the the even hair coat regardless of the time of the time of the year is, is that the indication is there more to it uh first and foremost yes clay uh uniform hair coat Nice, shiny, slick in the summer, more velveteen rabbit look in the winter when they're getting ready for uh, cold temperatures. And then um, that wedgy look to the cow going back. And then the opposite of that in the bull going forward. To tell a story, I was telling Gerald Fry one time I had a black bull. I really liked his shoulders, but uh, I didn't think his rear end was quite wide enough. And Gerald, uh, 10 years older than I, and 
He said, well, I'll bet every defensive player in the NFL could tell you how big Jim Brown's shoulders were, but I doubt there's one of them can tell you how wide his rear end was. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, you can get that out if you want. No, no, that's good. That's good. It stays in. That's fine. What about uh, glandular function uh, was one of the things you mentioned today. Uh, what are we looking for there? Well, again, that uniform hair coat, but there are a number of different indicators glandular function wise. Uh, uh, the adrenal hair whorl and a heifer, when she first starts producing estrogen, there'll be three, four, five hairs stick up in there and they'll remain standing until about a month after she gets pregnant. They'll lay down. Pancreatic hair whorl is low on the side. Uh, it varies from cow to cow, but three or four months after she gets pregnant, that will start growing. Extra teats on the back of the udders, more butterfat. Um, can't really think of any big ones. I guess if, if people want to test me out here at eight months of pregnancy, maybe earlier, a cow, a heifer, uh, looking at the pole, if she's got hair standing up that looks like Phyllis Diller, probably going to have a heifer calf. If it looks like dippity do all pasted down in front, probably going to be a bull calf. A fellow in Texas, after he heard that the next spring, he tried it and he said he got 23 out of 24 correct, just looking at the hair on the pole. The wind was blowing on the 20, 24th one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. it it's really, I, I think it's really practical and, and really helpful. Um, are you having any luck? getting getting out and doing uh some some seminars some uh workshops uh do you have any of those scheduled coming up i'm working on a couple clay i just did two here uh last weekend and the weekend before one was in ohio and then uh two weeks ago was there in faith south dakota um but i haven't put the finishing touches on the other two uh, yet. So I, I can't really say what we may or may not do. Sure. Is there a place where people could go to, to find some of those, uh, some of those upcoming events? Well, thank you for that. Taylor, T A I L O R Taylor made cattle.com. I try to update that website whenever I, uh, I put, have a new school or if I'm going to be in an area doing ranch consultations, you know, if you'd like me to stop by and help you out with wherever you're at, I typically try to have my travel schedule there because it minimizes the travel expense portion of, of coming to the farm or ranch. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I did want to cover uh, earlier that I has returned to my mind is um, about the issue of zip code. And about the issue of of buying bulls uh, from great or short distances away from you, uh, can you talk about your thinking on on some of those things? Um, first thing I want to say there is we all have better genetics than we're seeing get expressed because our epigenetics, the air, the water, the grass, the mineral, aren't good enough. However. Every time you move an animal, there's a period of adaptation. The better your property is, epigenetic-wise, the less time that's going to take. The better the property was you brought them from, the more similar maybe to yours, the less time that's going to take. The more adaptable the animal, good glandular function, hormonal function, and then that wedgy look to the cows, the less time it's going to take to get them adapted. Any, any major nuggets we left on the table today? Anything else that you were hoping we would, we would cover as far as uh, the, the issues we're talking about today? I guess one other thing that comes to mind, Clay, is it takes 120 days to change out all the red blood cells in the body. So the very worst time to bring a bull home is 60 days before you need him. You'd be better off to wait a hundred or excuse me, get him 120 days or more and really ad get him adapted. We could talk about that, but, or bring him home two days before you need him and just put him right out with the cows. Because by the time his semen quality and quantity had gone down, he'd probably have the cows pregnant already. 
That's good. So, uh, tailormade, cattle.com, uh, workingcows.net slash 160, workingcows.net slash 160 is show notes page for today. Uh, there will be links to uh, the Bonsma lectures, the Milch Cow, uh, Man, Cattle, and Veld, or Feld, uh, as it were. Uh, any other m- major, very helpful resources that you want put up there? I mentioned the word epigenetics earlier. The best lay person's book. All my fingers are pointing at me. I'm just a cowboy with an inquiring mind. Pottinger's Prophecy. It talks about human beings and what Francis Pottinger had found with cats. And these three authors show how that's played out in human beings. The exact same forces are at work in our cows. And there was, was there, was there an analog to that um, about a, a bull producer, or I think you mentioned somebody else's prophecy too at the school? Oh, I, uh, so patterned off of that, I have a, uh, a PowerPoint that I do at these schools called Drayson's Prophecy. James Drayson uh, measured a lot of bulls uh, around the Northwest, Midwest. Uh, 15,000 or so followed 4,500 from birth to death. And uh, he found a lot of things that we were starting to do wrong back in the 60s and 70s. 70s, he wrote his book. And I called it Drayson's Prophecy because he was telling us we were headed down the wrong path with bull fertility and cow fertility by, by embarking on this space race for cows. And that space race for cows produced a cow that is kind of or essentially the opposite of the cow that we've been trying to describe today. Is that accurate? Yes, I usually use the term the long, tall, stretched out broccoli rubber band that that uh, Zietzman, inherent body condition in a cow. We want a bull that looks like eight pounds of sugar in a five pound sugar sack. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate and, that. And not done with grain. We want to get them very well mineralized and the neighbors toxins out. Very good. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna talk more about that. Um I, I think I'm gonna track down the Swerzik brothers or uh, at least Steve Swerzik and and talk to him some more about uh the salt and and the conditioner and, and some of those things. So I appreciate that, that connection as well. Clay, thank you for the opportunity today. Well, Steve's uh, obviously a, a guy you could spend a lot of time uh, gathering wisdom from and really appreciate his humility and his willingness to share some of what he's gathered over uh, his career of learning uh, how to find cows that will work in your environment. And again, big part of it is, is the right zip code, but uh, worth worth the opportunity to look and see if you could find some of your cows that are able to do it more, do more on less input and some of those things. So hopefully uh, gave you some tools for, for finding those cows. Uh, really excited next week. Got a good discussion coming up with Dave Pratt, um, CEO Emeritus of Ranch Management Consultants, and he's got a new book out, and we're going to talk to Dave Pratt about his new book uh, next week for episode 161 of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.